Welcome, welcome, welcome to this history baking event for the Universalist Unitarian Church of Peoria and the Reverend Jennifer Innes. Today, after a long courtship of sorts, a getting to know you period that was challenged by a global pandemic, we will finally mutually commit to a long-term spiritual relationship between our minister and the congregation. This is epic, a generational change. For many of us, Reverend Jennifer is the only other full-time settled minister we will experience after the 28-year ministry of the Reverend Michael Brown. This event is in the same realm as moving away from our old church to what some of us still call the new church now more than 15 years ago. I think back to the fall of 2019 when the ministerial search committee first began our Sunday meetings. We formed a covenant and committed to find the best minister for our beloved community. I want to thank the committee one more time. Kathy Carter, David Waisner, Austin Locke, Mary Keister, Amanda Franklin, and Lindy Peterson for achieving our goal with the May 3rd congregational vote to call the Reverend Jennifer Ennis. Reverend Jennifer has answered our call with absolute commitment, moving her family here in the midst of the pandemic working remotely as a new minister, trying to meet and get to know everyone, all while keeping us safe. What an awesome start she has managed for this congregation. This installation ceremony confirms for the future our dedication to her and her dedication to us. One of the benefits of these virtual times is that we are not limited by space and travel to whom can attend this installation. Along with the congregation, Reverend Jennifer's extended family and friends are here by Zoom. You'll hear from her spouse, Reverend Patrick Price, whom most of us have not yet met. And I think the kids, Nate and Abby, will be making an appearance as well. So let us come together in worship, mindful of the many people who have traveled before us. We recognize and honor the Peoria people who thrived on these lands long before we were here. You'll note that many esteemed colleagues from the Universalist Unitarian Association, the UUA, are part of worship today. Reverend Meg Riley, co-moderator of the UUA, will be delivering the sermon, and Reverend Keith Cron, UUA Director of Transitions, will deliver the charge to the congregation. This is a recognition of the significance of this event, not only in our congregation, but in the denomination as well. So starting things off, the Reverend Sharon Dittmar, representing the Mid-America region of the UUA and a longtime friend and colleague of the Reverend Jennifer. Hello, my name is the Reverend Sharon Dittmar and I'm a Congregational Life Consultant with the Mid-America region of the UUA and an employee of your Unitarian Universalist Association. I bring you greetings and congratulations from both organizations today. The special day that represents an installation of the Universalist Unitarian Church of Peoria, Illinois, and the Reverend Jennifer Innes. I suppose in correct terminology as your minister is installed, but I truly believe it's the coming together of both of you that's what matters, what creates something special for all of us. And boy, do all of us need you. It's been a hard year. There's a lot of losses in this pandemic. There's been a lot of change. There's been an uprising and a lot of questions about who we are and who we will be. Please know that your congregation offers a life-saving vision of liberal ministry that has enabled many of us to go forward, to create, to right wrongs, to create the transformation that we need now in this hurting world. You have done many great things in the past. You have persevered to this moment in the presence, uh, present, and we are delighted. And frankly, I am just curious to see what you will create together in the future. Know that wherever you go, your UUA is here for you as a thought partner, to answer your questions, to be a companion, a guide in some ways, if you want one, but always your favorite cheerleader. Blessings on you. I cannot wait to see where you go. Hello, my name is Natalie Briscoe, and I am the lead for the Southern region of your Unitarian Universalist Association. 
It is a great pleasure and a privilege to be virtually here with you on this wonderful occasion, the installation of Reverend Jennifer Innes. One thing that I know about Reverend Innes is that she has a beautiful voice, both singing and prophetic. I know you will appreciate her candor, her vision, and her dedication to ministry. UU Church of Peoria, your mission is to embrace freedom, love inclusively, grow spiritually, and heal our world. And I have no doubt in my mind that Reverend Innes will be a wonderful partner with you in that difficult work and that you will indeed join your voices and make beautiful music together. Although Jennifer is not a native Texan, I believe in so many ways Texas claimed her over the 12 years of ministry she served here in the Lone Star State. As a voice for liberation and justice, both within the walls of the congregations she served and outside of them in the streets of the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex, Jennifer grew Unitarian Universalism in large and small ways, all the while learning to love Texas barbecue, hot starry nights, and the sound of the Dallas Cowboys fans' lamentations. So it is my honor to bring greetings from your neighbors, the member congregations in the Southern region, where Jennifer has spent a collected 17 years of ministry, and from Austin, Texas, where I am sitting right now, as we say with great joy, congratulations to you, Reverend Ennis, and to you, UU Church of Peoria, blessings on the next 20 years of your ministry, and well wishes for a long and faithful journey together. Hi, Reverend Jennifer. I am so excited to be able to work alongside you as you serve our Peoria community through the Affirming Faith Communities of Greater Peoria. Uh, it's great to be able to have another colleague in our community that's working towards full inclusion of LGBTQ people. Um, I have so enjoyed getting to know you and look forward to getting to know you more in the coming days and years as we work alongside each other here in Peoria.
Good morning, Universalist Unitarian Church of Peoria. I am the Reverend Marcus Foliano, and I am thrilled to be with you today on this joyous occasion and bring with me the love of all of my colleagues at the Unitarian Universalist Association. This I share with you today the words of my dear colleague and mentor, the late Reverend Dr. Hope Johnson. Reverend Dr. Hope Johnson shares these words, one love. We are one, a diverse group of proudly kindred spirits, here not by coincidence, but because we choose to journey together. We are active and proactive, we care deeply. We live our love as best we can. We are one, working, eating, laughing, playing, singing, storytelling, sharing, and rejoicing, getting to know each other, taking risks, opening up, questioning, seeking, searching, trying to understand, struggling, making mistakes, paying attention, asking questions, listening, living our answers, learning to love our neighbors, learning to love ourselves, apologizing and forgiving with humility, being forgiven with grace, creating the beloved community together. We are one. Hi, I'm Lindy Peterson, and I was the chair of the minister search committee that brought Reverend Jennifer to our church to candidate last spring. I just want to say I'm so proud of all the work that my fellow committee members put in over the course of search, and I'm super proud of everything our congregation done this, has done this last year to stay connected and to welcome a new minister that plenty of folks haven't even met in person yet. If what I've seen from our church this last year is anything to go by. The coming years will find us a vibrant congregation with inspired leadership and a talented minister. I'm excited to share that future with Jennifer and with you, and I can't wait to see everything we do together. Our chalice lighting today was written by our own Cinda Thompson with Reverend Jennifer Innes, and it's entitled a, a New Faith Rising. Our chalice curves, catches the spark and bursts into a flame, beckoning across space and through darkness, to light a way for each seeker on a journey unfolding into pain and into beauty. Reach forward, clasp open hands, form a circle, celebrate our infinite forms and spirits, join our beloved community, kindle the courage needed to create real change. Come, help heal our world. Hi everyone, I'm here to share some thoughts about honoring our congregation's past. Our church was founded on May 5th, 1843, which means it's been a part of our community for nearly 178 years. Wow. And during those years, our congregation has been served by 29 full-time settled ministers, including the one we are installing today, the Reverend Jennifer Innes. Every time a minister is installed, it's a momentous event in the history of our church. It represents both a continuation of our past and our next step into the future. That's certainly true of today's celebration, and yet in some ways this installation is different from all the others in our history. One difference is how we're getting together today. Our tradition is for installation services to be held in person with everyone gathered in the sanctuary. This year, because of the pandemic, we're not able to physically be together. Our installation committee had to figure out creative ways to use technology so we can still be together in spirit. Getting through this pandemic has been tough, but it's not the first time our congregation has had to overcome obstacles. Think about all the difficult times our church has survived, the Civil War, the 1918 influenza pandemic, the Great Depression, World War II, and so many others. Our congregation got through these challenges because they never gave up. 
That was also true in the early 1970s when the church was going through a serious financial crisis. The board had to make drastic budget cuts. They laid off several staff members and one of them was the custodian. The loss of that essential worker made it even harder to maintain our aging building on Hamilton Boulevard. So volunteers from the congregation stepped up. They made repairs. They dusted, swept, and vacuumed. They took out the garbage. They cleaned the toilets. Many of these volunteers were among the church's most influential members. Eventually, the church was able to not only survive, but thrive again, thanks to the congregation's determination, hard work, generosity, creativity, and team spirit. All those qualities are part of our legacy, and they are still with us today. Another part of our legacy is the role of women in our church. Back in the 1860s, women from the Peoria Universalist Church helped our local community in many ways. They established a school to teach young women how to sew. They created a program to visit needy families in the city and give them food, clothing, blankets, and coal. They established the Home for the Friendless, which later became the children's home that still exists today. During World War II, women from our church worked with the American Red Cross to provide clothing for displaced children overseas. These women and many others have made important contributions in leadership, social action, fundraising, and many other roles throughout our church's history. Recently, we benefited from having Reverend Linda White as our associate minister, and we're so grateful for her caring presence. But in 178 years, our congregation has never installed a cisgender woman as our full-time settled minister until now. By installing Reverend Jennifer Innes, we are celebrating another important first for our congregation. We often think of history as looking back at the past, reflecting on what we did years ago. But it's more than that. History is happening right now. We are making history today. And when we make history, we are creating the future. So I invite you to savor this moment as we celebrate our history and step into our future together.
Our reading is Choose to Bless the World by the Reverend Dr. Rebecca Parker. Your gifts, whatever you discover them to be, can be used to bless or curse the world. The mind's power, the strength of hands, the reaches of the heart, the gift of speaking, listening, imagining, seeing, waiting. Any of these can serve to feed the hungry, bind up wounds, welcome the stranger, praise the sacred, do the work of justice, or offer love. Any of these can draw down the prison door, hoard bread, abandon the poor, obscure what is holy, comply with injustice, or withhold love. You must answer this question. What will you do with your gifts? Choose to bless the world. The choice to bless the world is more than an act of will, a moving forward into the world with the intention to do good. It is an act of recognition, a confession of surprise, a grateful acknowledgement that in the midst of a broken world, unspeakable beauty, grace, and mystery abide. There is an embrace of kindness that encompasses all life, even yours. And while there is injustice, anesthetization, or evil, there moves a holy disturbance, a benevolent rage, a revolutionary love, protesting, urging, insisting that which is sacred will not be defiled. Those who bless the world live their life as a gesture of thanks for its beauty and this rage. The choice to bless the world can take you into solitude to search for the sources of power and grace, native wisdom, healing, and liberation. More, the choice will draw you into community, the endeavor shared, the heritage passed on, the companionship of struggle, the importance of keeping faith. The life of ritual and praise, the comfort of human friendship, the company of earth, the chorus of life welcoming you. None of us alone can save the world. Together, this is another possibility waiting. Friends, I bring greetings from the two congregations I serve here in Chicago, the Beverly Unitarian Church and the First Unitarian Church of Chicago. An installation is like a family reunion of congregations. Whatever miles or years lay between us, whether or not we even know each other, it turns out we're connected, connected to each other, and connected to bound in community with every person who has enabled us to reach this moment. I met Gene Adams, the Reverend Gene Adams, in 2002. Before Gene was ordained as a Universalist minister in 1945, he was a professional boxer. A knockout at the old Boston Garden brought his career to an end, but he brought that same toughness into ministry. He brought it with him to Selma when he marched with Dr. King in 1965. He brought that resilience back to Massachusetts with him as an unwavering supporter of civil rights in the deeply segregated suburbs of Boston. Reverend Adams lived a life of conviction and of service, but not of financial reward, because that's how ministry works. 
And when I met him on a bare retirement income, he was one like thousands of ordinary folks who did extraordinary things to hand this faith into our care now. The Living Tradition Fund offers assistance grants to people like Gene when they hit a financial emergency. Seminarians, ministers, religious professionals, congregational staff, retired ministers and their loved ones. This fund gives them some kind of a safety net. This fund gives debt reduction grants also to new ministers to help them get a better financial footing. This fund makes an immediate and tangible difference for our new ministers. Attending an installation before pandemic, I'd pack my ministerial robe and a stole, wallet, keys, phone, and then I'd pause to make sure I had a blank check with me. I wanted to be ready for this moment in the service because it's not just any old Sunday offering that I can miss and catch up on next week. It's a rare thing to have so tangibly and directly the chance to make a gift that sustains the past and present and future of Unitarian Universalism that makes all of this possible. We sit in the shade of trees we did not plant that we might be the planters for a new generation. And right now, immediately, I am inviting you to make that abstraction concrete. Make that commitment real with a gift to the Living Tradition Fund. I'm inviting you to stretch. I'm inviting you to give more than you plan to. You might not get the chance to give again for years. Make a financial commitment at a scale that honors the generations who enabled us to reach this moment and be a part of planting our shared future bound in community across miles and years. I invite you to give as generously as you are able, which probably means I invite you to give more generously than you expected. In gratitude, this offering is given and received.
on this day, on this special day. I'm Meg Riley and i am never been to Peoria, so I'll still have to come sometime. But meanwhile, it's lovely to see your sanctuary and to meet some of you virtually and to see people that I've known for years and brand new friends. Choose to bless the world, Rebecca Parker instructs us. She says, you must answer this question. What will you do with your gifts? Choose to bless the world. Or as another writer instructed much longer ago in Deuteronomy, I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your children may live. Choose life. Choose to bless the world. Neither of those things is as easy as they might sound, as lovely as those words might sound. What does it mean now, in 2021, in Peoria, <coughs> in the United States, in a pandemic, in a time when authoritarianism is on the rise globally, when neighbors can't agree on the most basic facts, when cruelty and oppression thrive, when scientists weigh our odds daily about survival as a species, what does it mean to choose life, to choose to bless the world when death is all around us and danger right beside us? It is a frightening time for us all, even though more people have gotten vaccinated and and you hear talk about life getting back to normal, we have to question whether normal is a word with any meaning anymore. Spending this past year vigilantly avoiding one another for fear of contagion or death won't go away with a shot. Watching our government teeter towards fascism, trying to hold our own days and families together, sorting truth from lies daily as we maneuver in our communities and our, even our families and neighborhoods. And the news is exhausting. How are we going to summon energy to bless life? I don't know about you, but on my own, I can't do it. I simply can't. My understanding is too small. My lived experience is inadequate to the task. My gifts are insufficient. I need what Parker calls the endeavor shared, the comfort of human friendship, the company of earth. I know I'll still make mistakes. I'll never get things right all the time, but I stand a better chance if I have other people ready to help me. So for better or for worse, I've thrown in my lot throughout my life with Unitarian Universalism and Unitarian Universalists, and as you say, Universalist Unitarians, a faith which has held me throughout my life through changes and growth, through times when I've turned to a variety of religious metaphors or practices, through the deaths of loved ones, through times of profound hope for the world and profound disillusionment and despair. I have needed and continue to need what Parker calls the companionship of struggle. Though the expression and practice of my faith may have changed through the years, my commitment to Unitarian Universalism has stayed rooted in deep relationships with particular people through my commitment to keep learning, keep open, keep allowing curiosity to lead me, to keep saying yes to life. Kathy Parker described just such a history of this congregation, the leaders who said yes over and over throughout the many years of this congregation's life. As I age, the particular relationships which have held me throughout my life have become more and more essential to me. Those relationships are with people I've been inspired by, some alive and some dead. And with the lineage in which we live, the people who made it possible to be here now, those whose struggles and visions and challenges we inherit. This faith is forever unfinished and it is a communal effort. 
I hope and pray that what I say today might be of use to this congregation in your relationships with one another and with the wider community as you move forward into this new ministry. So how do we choose to bless the world now? First, we need to ground ourselves so that we know exactly who we are and what gifts we have to offer the world. Otherwise, we may attempt to offer blessings which are not ours to give. If we do that, if we try to do that, we'll become depleted and anemic and our attempt at blessing will not be of use to anyone. Grounding ourselves involves in part employ employing what James Baldwin calls moral memory. For those of us who carry the privilege of white skin, using moral memory is painful, but it is necessary if we are to discern the blessings which we can genuinely offer. Baldwin wrote more than 50 years ago, white people hear me. History, as nearly no one seems to know, is not merely something to be read and it does not apply merely or even principally to the past. On the contrary, the great force of history comes from the fact that we carry it within us, are unconsciously controlled by it in many ways, and history is literally present in all that we do. We heard a brief history of the congregation today, and that's a great starting place. But using moral memory means interrogating the actions and inactions of this congregation throughout its history, putting it together with the history of Peoria and Illinois and the United States and the world. Just as those of us who are older tend to spend some of our time reflecting on our lives for better and for worse, we also need to do that together in communities. For instance, a quick Google search of Peoria tells me that in 2016, you were on the list of 10 worst cities in the US for African Americans to live in. My own beloved hometown, Minneapolis, was also on that list. For both cities, all of the markers about housing and jobs and education and transportation uh. make it clear that as much as we here in Minneapolis, and I suspect you there, love to boast about our great quality of life, it is not a shared experience. I'm inspired by congregations who are engaging in deep reflection about local history involving the theft of land and violence towards indigenous people, the creation of anti-black policies, which have created the radically unequal cities we now inhabit. It's not fun work, but it's clarifying and doing that work helps us to know what blessings we can legitimately offer our communities, some of which must be in the realm of restitution and reparations. This is the nature of inheriting faiths which were steeped in the arrival of white settlers in the slave trade, which benefited not only white people in the South, but the Yankees who benefited from the trade. We have to interrogate our history and surface what is sometimes hidden from our sight. As Baldwin says, go back to where you started as far back as you can and tell the truth about it. Of course, there are many ways that we who are white have a hard time doing this. We've been lied to for so long about our superiority as white people that we've become ignorantly smug about our exceptionalism and our innocence. We don't even sometimes, speaking for myself, know how to see truth amidst all the lies and propaganda. And that's where we need the voices of other people to help us. People of color and other people who see us from the outside, often knowing our own truth means letting go of our preconceived notions and listening to other people. For those who are men, it means listening to people who are other genders. For those who are cisgender, it means listening to people who are trans or non-binary. For those of us who are able-bodied, it means listening to people who are disabled. For those of us who have enough money, it means listening to poor people. There's so much listening to do to have moral memory. One question we might ask when we want to identify the blessings we offer our world is who would care and who would have cared at various points of our history if we ceased to exist. We heard a little bit of that story, the people who held the congregation together in the 1970s in a difficult time. 
I think about a few years ago when a Methodist urban church here in Minneapolis caught on fire. And this is a church that was so engaged with the progressive community that housed the radio um, station, the community radio station. They had community gardens. They had all kinds of support groups and did anti-war trainings and everything else you can imagine. And when I heard that the building was on fire, without even knowing why, I just rushed over to see because I cared so much. And when I got there, there were thousands of people literally surrounding the building, Somali mothers, Hmong farmers, GLBT activists, artists, environmentalists. Very few of us were Methodists. We simply knew how precious this community was. And that made me reflect on who would care if our congregations caught on fire? Would the wider community come out in horror to surround the building because it was a loss to them? It's a good measure to see what kind of blessings we're offering the world to wonder who would grieve if we no longer offered them. The world is not looking for abstract pronouncements of blessing any more than you or I are happy when someone who doesn't know us or know our story tells us that they're praying for us. We want to feel care in concrete and particular ways. I want to be known by people. I want to be participating in a shared life with other people. Choosing to bless the world means choosing to participate in active engagement in the struggles for humanity, which are raging all around us. Participation can mean that we're the center of defining and leading, or it can mean that we support the leadership of others. For those of us who are used to being in leadership, who are used to having our voices heard and our perspectives valued, it can mean being quiet and listening, supporting other people's ideas and desires. For me at this stage, participation overwhelmingly means relationship building and listening to people in the margins whose lives and experiences I don't share. Getting to know people and building trust so that as events unfold, relationships are strong enough to respond. Relationships that are mutual and joyful and painful and real. On September 12, 2001, then brand new UUA president Bill Sinkford and I spent the day with the board of the American Muslim Council. We didn't initiate a meeting that morning. It had already been scheduled as a getting to know you meeting because Bill Sinkford was coming to Washington DC to visit. If we had not already been in relationship, we would not have spent the day in the deep painful, meaningful conversations of that day. Crises are not time to build relationships. They must be nurtured over time. So when we covenant together, we're saying that we're stronger together, we're stronger with others. We can become more of ourselves when we're in community. Reaching out, engaging with partners who share our values to create the world we dream about, we can become stronger and stronger. As we celebrate the beginning of this new era in this congregation today, may you practice Unitarian Universalism together in ways which strengthen individuals and families, small groups and ministries, which allow spiritual depth and wisdom to flow in and through the wider community in ways which excite and fulfill not only our dreams and those on whose shoulders we stand, but in practices which are a blessing truly to the world. As Rebecca Parker says, none of us alone can save the world. Together, that is another possibility waiting.
trustees for the Universalist Unitarian Church, I will now read the words of the act of installation representing our congregation. I wish those of you watching virtually here to shout out your affirmation at the right moment. I'll give you the cue and you can use the, shout, the chat box or shout out at home. But I would ask that all of those who are present speak loud and clear and represent those who are not present physically. As an act of installation, we come together in unity to install the Reverend Jennifer Innes as our settled minister of the Universalist Unitarian Church of Peoria. In our denomination, the relationship we are about to recognize lies wholly between the people of the church and the minister they have chosen. It is therefore fitting that this traditional act of installation be performed by the members of this church. In this way, we give te testament to our freedom and our heritage of congregational democracy. The act of installation symbolizes a pledge between the members of a congregation and the minister whom they have chosen. The relationship is based on mutual confidence, respect, and trust, and is undertaken by mutual consent. Reverend Jennifer Innes, we have called you to live among us, to provide spiritual leadership, pastoral care, and thoughtful guidance. Encouragement in times of sorrow. Encouragement in times of joy, times of ease, and times of challenges. We have called you to lead us in the paths of understanding, righteousness, and peace, giving us spiritual guidance, speaking the truth in love, and teaching us by word and example. Reverend Jennifer, are you ready to enter this covenant with us formally and formally? I am. <laughs> <laughs> now, members of our UU Church, I invite you to rise in body and in spirit and join in me as I share these words printed in your order of service. We, the members of the Universal Unitarian Church of Peoria, do hereby do hereby install you, Jennifer Innes, and Jennifer as, Innes minister as minister of our congregation, congregation, for our part, our pledge to walk with you in the ways, ways of truth, truth justice, justice, and passion, and love. And love. We offer you a free pulpit, a free pulpit, pulpit the cooperation, cooperation, cooperation of our hearts, our hearts and, 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 and our resolution good goodwill. Members, are you willing to take up these obligations? If so, say we are in the chat or in your voice. We are. We are. We are, <laughs> we are ready and willing to take upon ourselves these obligations. We cherish our church and all that it has been, all it currently offers us, and what it may become through all our combined efforts. Therefore, we, the members of the UU Church of Peoria, do install you as our settled minister and offer you our encouragement and assistance in fulfilling your duties among us. And now, members, will you join in this commitment by typing in the chat or just shout out to me, we will. We will. we will. With joy and with a deep sense of responsibility, with gratitude for your confidence, 
Look in the pulpit. Oh my gosh, it's happening. It's real with people. I formally take up the ministry to which you have called me. I pledge to maintain the freedom of the pulpit, to speak the truth in love, to fulfill all the many duties of ministry, maybe even more than we've already had to do this year. We will see what comes. Above all, I will cherish and cultivate the ways of reason, love and justice and spiritual growth among you, in me and in our larger world. Amen. We present this stole by Kit Wright to Reverend Jennifer Innes on the occasion of her installation today as Minister of the Universalist Unitarian Church of Peoria. It is based on, a, on the stained glass window, which is used as our logo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is a good time to ooh and ah. Yes. <laughs> Can leave it on the right way? Yes, I think so. The children, families, and grown-ups in our congregation want to welcome Reverend Jennifer into our church family as well. In that spirit, our church community created the unique piece of rainbow colored artwork on the altar today. It is comprised of individually traced and decorated handprints, which are filled with some wonderful images, uh, messages of welcome and hopes for our future together. It may not be fancy, but it was made with love. We would like you to accept this as our hug and our thunderous applause at your installation today. Welcome. We are so very happy to have you. Thank you. It is beautiful. <laughs> and one of my favorite chalice lightings as well. <laughs> Jennifer, oh, you went away, I can't see you. It is an honor to offer the charge to the minister. For those here for whom this is a new experience, I will explain that this is traditionally an opportunity for someone with many years of ministerial experience to offer sage advice to a new minister. Reverend Jennifer, you're not a new minister and I'm not a minister at all. However, you are beloved to me, and you are a person who believes that sage advice can come from all sorts of places. I will share some thoughts with you, a charge, which I will think of as an invitation with some teeth in the presence of this congregation as witness. Ministry is one of those callings that is sometimes little understood by many who believe they know exactly what it is. The multiple roles a minister plays in a congregation may sometimes be ranked in order of importance by members according to what they themselves prioritize. Reverend Jennifer, I invite you to be thoughtful and reflective about how you make choices about what to prioritize and how to use your time. Your skills, the congregation's needs, 
and the other skills. And the availability of staff or ministerial colleagues are a complex, ever-changing garden. Oh, look, it's me. Reverend Jennifer, you will hold the well-being of the whole beloved community to lead, teach, nurture, comfort, and administrate according to the congregation's needs. But it's never going to be your responsibility to do so according to each individual want or desire. Trust your own wisdom. Seek advice and counsel from colleagues about how to hold the whole even as individual parts cry out for attention. It is an unfortunate truth that many of us were raised to believe that we are responsible for the happiness and well being of others. And sometimes others of us likewise expect still others to be responsible for their happiness, or at a minimum, for meeting them at their point of unhappiness and just staying there with them, stuck if not actually fixing it. It is never the job of a minister or a congregation for that part to make all the people happy. This would require perfection and therefore an actual magic wand. But this is my magic wand. There's only one of them and you can't have it. So alas, no perfection for you. I can't count how many times someone has said to me, if you're on an airplane and the oxygen masks drop, put your own on first so that you can save the child next to you. But that's just not right. We're not supposed to care for ourselves so that we can care for others. When the oxygen mask drops, we are supposed to put it on so that we don't die, so that we live and thrive. Then we put one on the child next to us so that they don't die, so that they live and thrive. Two actions distinct. Your responsibility is not simply for the health and well being of your congregation, but to prioritize your own health and well being, the health and well being of your family, and your calling here to attend to the health and well being of the congregation. I charge you to love yourself, your family, and the congregation in that order. Be a tree with roots planted deep, taking nourishment and providing stability with a trunk that is consistent, strong, and predictable, with limbs and leaves that can bend and flow, that react to the wind and shelter people from rain, that turn up to the sky and toward one another in worship. I charge you to be that tree. I want you to permit your congregation to nurture and attend your roots, fertilizing and aerating as is called for in measured and agreed upon ways. A tree grows slowly over time. Each season, something new, building upon what came previously. Sometimes there's fast growth in years when sun, air, and water are optimal, and sometimes slower growth while some energy goes toward healing from an injury. Model steadfast patience as you and the congregation move forward and grow in faith and beloved community. You started your ministry here in a pandemic. I don't know if anyone else has ever done that before. Others are doing it now, but I can't find it in a book. We have no idea how it will make what comes next different and new. But we do know that the beginning and now the continuation of your ministry here was being completely invented, created, and recreated as you went along. Any desire moving forward to get things back to air quotes normal is literally impossible. You and your congregation don't share a normal, except the normal that has been created as the ways you have joyously gathered as a congregation online to make meaning and connection. You can reimagine and reconnect even as you imagine and connect in new ways for the first time. This puts you in a wonderfully creative position. I charge you to experiment. 
over the years, I've heard you say many times, well, I'll try this thing. And if it doesn't work, we'll try something else. I would like to invite you to a different standard moving forward. I invite you to say, we're gonna try a thing and then another thing and then another thing. And after we have tried many things, we will explore which parts of which ones we would like to put together and build upon. Don't try things without process or warning. Always remember that surprised people respond poorly, but work with congregational leadership to chart multiple paths forward and try new things. Experiment with connection and relationship, activities and actions. Our Unitarian Universalist living tradition will thrive as you lead toward life, toward wholeness and congregational health, supporting your congregation as they bless the world. From the rooted grounding of your own health and well being, your families, and the congregations. And finally, Reverend Jennifer, you are, and I charge you to continue to be, a blessing to the world yourself. Amen. Blessed be, and make it all be so. Good afternoon. It is good to be with you, to see a sanctuary that is familiar, to see so many familiar faces and so many familiar foreheads. I'm delighted to charge you today, and I'm going to start by telling a story. Before I became a Unitarian Universalist minister, I taught fourth grade. At the end of every year, I would have my fourth graders write notes to the incoming class about what to expect for the upcoming year. One year, Tasha composed this letter. Dear new fourth grader, welcome to this room. In Mr. Cron's class, you will learn a lot about geography, do some really cool science experiments. You'll get to read a lot of books. Mr. Cron will read to you every day. He will even read you Winnie the Pooh. You'll really like Mr. Cron. You'll really hate Winnie the Pooh. Love, Tasha. And with that, Tasha went off to fifth grade to Mr. Dykus's class, not knowing what to expect there. Each of us probably has learned some geography over this past year. We've participated in some science experience and science experiments involving social distancing, mask wearing, and washing our hands. We've even had more time to read. And we too are moving to a new grade, a new phase of life, as we move toward coming out of a pandemic that will undoubtedly change our lives. What have you learned in the last year? And what will a new year be like in a new classroom of the world? I doubt that any of us were alive during the last pandemic, though some may remember your parents or elders talking about it. If we look back at that, we might actually learn some clues about what's coming next for us. Back then, we elected a populist president who was racked with scandal. We invoked pro prohibition as a way to keep unruly immigrants in check. There was hysteria about immigration, especially Asian immigrants, whom the country created a quota for. Discriminatory housing practices created urban ghettos, and the KKK took control of state legislatures in Indiana, Oregon, Oklahoma, and Texas. Their membership rose in five years from 3 million to 8 million. The Tulsa race massacre happened. There was a fear that communism would take hold. And yet, at the same time, more women moved into the workplace, got the right to vote, and became more sexually liberated. It was the age of jazz, the Harlem Renaissance, and the first radio station. Three out of four people went to the movies once a week. The Model T and mass production made cars affordable, and sales tripled over the next decade. We saw five a five-day, 40-hour week, work week used as an incentive to bring workers into plants 
as long as they wouldn't unionize. People spent extravagantly on things like washing machines, electric razors, and other products, often on credit. And eventually, the start back market crashed. The secular folks of the time had little use for religion and conservative religious folks decided liberalism, especially revolution, was going to be the downfall of society. The world was changing too quickly for some and not fast enough for others. Jump ahead a hundred years and here we are in an eerily similar moment. And what will Unitarian Universalism, specifically you, do with this moment? I read a theory recently which believed that the demise of religion in Europe following World War I and the pandemic was a result of this, a continent that was racked with war and loss was used to religion giving them answers. Indeed, one church in England sent one, one day eight young men from their congregation off to war, all of whom died on the same day in battle. That church had no answers. What religion could in fact ever ask, answer the question, why did this happen? And if it couldn't answer the question about, about it, then back then, what was the point of religion? The people in Europe stopped going. Being somewhat removed from World War I, we were less affected by this horror. But the horror we have now experienced has involved the loss of over half a million people in our country. Our lives have been disrupted. People have lost jobs. Depression and despair have skyrocketed. Social isolation has been devastating. Violence has increased. A 17-year-old child with an assault rifle kills two people in Kenosha. Brianna Taylor shot in her sleep. Ask a black person and they will tell you about the witness and execution of George Floyd on the news night after night after night. We too will never be the same. Will we experience a demise of religion or will we be a faith of hope? And what must we do? My charge to you as a congregation is threefold. People coming out of the pandemic will be looking for community and joy. You must be a congregation of community and joy. People will be looking for more life. They will be looking for people who are curious to explore and companion with them. Literally, you all must play in Peoria because people will be looking for that. But that is not all people will be looking for. Some 15 years ago, I was asked by a tennis buddy, tennis buddies, Greg and Danny, to conduct their wedding in Canada. And I gladly agreed. Two of the nicest guys on the planet. A few years later, they adopted Zach. And Zach was clearly one of the happiest kids on the planet. Then last year, Greg was diagnosed with cancer. He spent much of the year in the hospital, alone, his husband and son unable to be with him. Two weeks ago, Greg died, having spent most of his last year sick and isolated. I think of my friend Rod, who lost his wife in a nursing home this year. He had to be lifted into a cherry picker to her window to wave goodbye her, to her. With her dementia, she did not recognize him, unable to hear his familiar voice or hold his hand. We will come out of this pandemic with so many people holding on to grief that they were not able to do in community. People living with losses, great and small. Our faith can be a place that doesn't answer why that happened, but we can be the place that lets people work through their grief and wrestle with what purpose can my life have now? How do I make sense of the world? Do I have to be happy all the time? My second charge to you is to be a place where people can grieve however long 
they need to grieve for. And lastly, be a place where people can be a part of making a difference in the wider world. As Meg said, we will desperately need that. Our country desperately needs a church that understands what systematic racism is, sees disability and mental health as a justice issue, honors people's understanding of their gender and sexual orientation, looks beyond class, and where people of all ages can be teachers and learners. And we need a congregation that lets everyone be more than a single story, sharing their own frame of the world, where they're able to search for meaning in a community of people and live a life where they too can make the world a better place. So this is my charge to you. Be a religion of joy, grief, and justice. And if you don't think there's enough justice in the world, I asked Tasha's fifth grade teacher if on some rainy day he could find a moment and read to the class Winnie the Pooh. He did. Go forth in this new moment we are about to embark on and bless the world. Greetings, Universalist Unitarian Church of Peoria. I bring you greetings from what was a sunny Northeastern Florida, but perhaps it's the weather to not rub it in anyone's face at this moment. I ask that you bear with me as we are all trying to navigate just how are we going to do a laying on a hands virtually? Well, we're all going to do this together. Laying on our hands, as we all well know, is this ancient practice that's used for healing and blessing throughout human cultures. It's a practice that intentionally invokes what we Unitarian Universalists understand as that transcending mystery and wonder affirmed in all cultures. And it invites that spirit to move through us to a renewal of the spirit and an openness to the forces that create and uphold life. When we are born, it is by hands that we are delivered into the world. And as we grow, it is hands that hold us, that feed us, that wash us. As we further emerge through the world, it is with our hands that we offer friendship, solace, companionship, and love. And during this pandemic, it is our hands through which we have washed multiple times and put on masks that helped mitigate its effects. And as we well know, at the end of life, we lay hands upon our loved one as they are called, as we call their name, and they are called into that which is beyond this lifetime. And so during the laying on of hands in a religious ceremony such as this, the gathered community presses upon she who has been called to a position of leadership and responsibility, our wishes and intentions for her and the blessing of that transcending mystery and wonder. So this afternoon, we're going to practice this old form of laying on hands in a new way. And so in just a moment, we will virtually lay hands upon Jennifer and press into her our intentions and blessings for her ministry. But first, a few instructions on how we will do this. So to begin, I invite you to take a moment as you are able, and if it hopefully will work, we did this little choreography um, before the service began, to adjust your Zoom room to gallery view. So if you know how to do that, or if you haven't done so already, there's an icon in the upper right-hand corner of your screen that says view. And so I invite you to put it on gallery. And then you click on that icon and now you should see several windows on the screen of all of us intending, attending this installation. And we're ordered in several rows and several columns like tic-tac-toe or connect four or some of us from that particular generation, the Brady Bunch. So if you're not able to do this or this feature isn't available to you at the moment, that is okay, please. 
don't let a technical difficulty or the means through which you're joining this service interrupt your experience of the laying on of hands. Just simply keep your view with Jennifer as pinned. Each of us is viewing a slightly different Zoom room, and what I see on my screen is not likely what you are seeing on yours and your neighbor is seeing on theirs. The, Be the Peoria Congregation's tech staff and I have arranged our view, our galleries, in order to have Jennifer in the center to create that circling of her that we would normally do during a laying on of hands. And then the windows surrounding Jennifer, if you happen to notice, some of them have an exclamation point. Those are Jennifer fa Jen's family members. And then surrounding those windows with an at sign are members of the congregation. Again, don't worry about putting an exclamation point or an at sign, just roll with us, right? But just so you know, this is what I'm looking at. So we've got Jennifer in the center and the surrounding Jen are her family members and then surrounding her family members are congregation members and then following surrounding the congregation members are the collegial colleagues and friend, Jen's friends and other associates. So that's the screen that I'm looking at and presumably Jen is looking at as well. Now, again, you don't need to arrange your screen in such a way, you still be able to participate and experience this act of laying on hands just as you are. You only need to have your beautiful faces streaming because it's at this time, I now invite you to scroll through the gallery view on your screen, which I'm gonna have to do in a second here. So scroll through the gallery view on your screen and see all the beloveds who are gathered here. On my screen, I'm seeing approximately 25 people and four screens. So doing math in public, that's approximately at least 100 people who are here. So if you know how to follow your screen and scroll through all who are here, I invite you to click the right ar the arrow that should be to the right. Just take a moment to see who is there. And if seeing isn't available to you, again, just sense the others who are gathered here now. And while Jennifer is the minister called to this congregation, I invite you to do this because the work of the ministry is done through all of us who are here, the board members, the committee members, the children, youth, parents, children, the teachers in religious education, all of us are a part of this shared ministry. Ministerial colleagues, religious professionals, staff members, volunteers, all of you are a part of this shared ministry. The members and friends of Peoria, newcomers, long timers, members of the wider community, People are here because you care about making the world a better place. And all of you, all of us are a part of this shared ministry. And so this is where I get a little technical. So I'm, I'm going to finally invite you to rise in a way that's comfortable for you. If you're wearing pajama bottoms, that's okay. But I invite you to rise in a way that's comfortable for you and to join me in this position now, mind you, I have to uh, do some technical aspects of this. So I'm only gonna be using one hand during the actual laying on of hands. But I invite you to join me in this position, which is put your left hand on your heart. Hey, Cynthia? Yes, ma'am. We wanna have some folks come up to the chancel with me? Correct. So now is a good time for those who are going to join Jennifer at the chancel. who are going to be modeling this. All right. Jen, is everyone in place? Working on it. Okay. Thoughts? Uh, Austin? Yes. Okay. Not Austin, there goes our tech. <laughs> oh, he's good, he's good. You good? Okay. Good. So everyone's in place, Jen? Yes. All right. So finally, I invite you to rise in a way that's comfortable to, to all of you and join me in this position, which is putting your left hand on your heart and taking your right hand with your palm towards the screen. And so our hands on our heart is a way that we connect to the truth that lies within us, our personal stories and our struggles. And it connects us with our hopes and our aspirations for Jennifer and this congregation. So just take a moment and breathe and pause. And by rising together with our hand on our heart, 
and our outstretched palm, we're giving physical form in this virtual space to this spiritual truth that we are all connected and we need one another, perhaps right now in more ways than we know. And so in this position, I invite all of us to enter into that spirit of prayer and blessing as you do according to your custom. Let us pray. God, whom each of us knows in our own way, yet similarly in each of our hearts, you have called your people out of solitude, that being one body, they might be animated by the spirit. And so this afternoon, we gather in recognition of one who is called by you to a life of service and compassion, the Reverend Jennifer Innes, and to install her as minister of the Universalist Unitarian Church of Peoria. Though we might not be together physically, we are nonetheless connected in ways that are real and necessary and connect to this great congregation as members and staff, family and friends of Jennifer, as local and interfaith partners, as community members and colleagues, as Unitarian Universalists from near and far. We are connected across generations and across miles, and we pray for blessings upon this ministry that works and, ser and serves to build a spiritual community, to honor the diversity that is present and yet to come, and to advocate for peace and justice in Peoria and the surrounding area. Beloved Presence, keep and keep Jennifer close to those examples and guides who have brought her thus far, from her earliest days in Massachusetts and earliest ministry in Maine, to the plains of Texas and now to the prairies of Illinois. From her grandmothers, Lois Innes Hackett and Charlotte de Amore, and her parents, Charles and Wendy, brothers, Tom and Will, to her family of Patrick and Nate and Abby, and the many others of the Innes and Price lineage. The historical examples beginning all the way back with Eve and Adam and Abraham and Modus, Moses, Buddha and Jesus and Muhammad, Margaret Fuller and Ralph Waldo Emerson and Thomas Starr King, Reese Williams and Clinton Lee Scott and Thomas Michelson. May their stories encourage and embolden Jen in the work ahead and may their examples provide guidance for her. And finally, God, in this moment, we ask that you hear our silent prayers and intentions that we send from our hearts, through our hands, through this screen, to streaming it in Peoria, Illinois at this moment. Hear our silent prayers for Jen and her ministry. God, we know that there is joy in the work to come. May expressions of gratitude and appreciation flow freely. May there be courage for honest and sometimes hard conversations. May forgiveness and grace be found with the walls, within the walls of the brick and mortar building, as well as in the cyberspace of Zoom rooms like these and elsewhere. So the embrace of freedom, freedom and an inclusion of love may grow spiritually here in Peoria and beyond to heal our world. In the names of all that is most holy, we humbly pray. Amen, blessed be, and shalom. I invite you now to please resume a seated position, and if you wish to remove the gallery view and pin the view of the sanctuary. My colleague Josh Lee wasn't able to join us this afternoon, but we know from his earlier welcome that we receive his blessing and his greeting in this moment. So now we can move into our closing hymn, Now Let Us Sing. Sing, 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 sing,
sing. Lift up your voice, be not afraid. Now let us sing to the power of the hope within. Now let us sing, 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 sing. Now let us sing, 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 sing. Lift up your voice, be not afraid. Now let us sing to the power of the love within. Now let us sing. not the light of truth, the warmth of community, the fire of commitment, or the power of transformation. I These love it. We carry in our hearts until we are together again. We've entered this moment in worship in an old way. We entered this moment of service in a new way. We have lifted up the story of this congregation. We have refreshed our larger message in this faith that we may be so charged and take up the charge of going forth and helping to repair the world. We have entered into new promises with a hopeful and a joyful spirit. All this we have done in this moment and so much more we shall do together. The benediction that is here that I am offering now, this good word, we have already been creating it together. May we go forth from this place. May we keep choosing to bless ourselves, each other, and the world. How may we be such a gift to all that is. Our worship is ended. Let our service begin. Amen. Mm -hmm.